Hello and welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. You're listening to another life-changing word from Pastor Jason Anderson. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. Well, good morning, church family. What's up, Living Word? It's so good to be back. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed a couple of weeks with my family. Much needed time. I got tanner and I got a little fatter. And ha- Don't laugh at that. And we had... Uh, But I miss you guys uh, terrible. I love what I do. I love preaching the Word of God, and I'm excited to be with you this morning. Let's pray and get right into it. Father God, I thank you and praise you, Lord, for this time. I ask, Lord, that you'd open up our hearts to receive your Word, that it's manna, that it's bread, and that it's practical for us this week. We can use it. Lord, your Word is also seed in our hearts, and it grows us and produces, changes us, transforms us from the inside. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. This morning, teach us what we need to know and prepare us for what's coming in our lives. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. About four months ago or three months ago, I don't really remember how long it was, I I gave a message about God believing in you. I want to give a similar message today. It's about us believing in each other, about our ability to pull out potential in someone else by having faith in them, or someone else having been placed in our lives by God who sees things in us that we ourselves have not yet seen. And uh, I told a story about me being in the fourth grade and running. I ran in the fourth grade against the whole entire school at track and field day. And a little short Jason, who was quite dorky uh, in the fourth grade, quite an outcast, not a lot of friends, if any, uh, was the shortest kid in my class, um, won the race. I won the race in front of everyone, and everybody cheered. I I said it was one of the greatest days of my life. Do you remember this story? And I was telling you how, uh, of, of, you know, I'm mean, obviously second to, you know, meeting Jesus and being married and, and three of my four children being born. This was a, <laughs> the greatest day I had ever experienced in, in my life. And uh, I suddenly showed up on the radar in my school, you know. People knew me because I had won. I don't know. I was, it, was, it was a big thing. But then also I started getting bullied. All of a sudden, uh, some of the kids started picking on me. How many know that that whether you're in fourth grade or whether you're an adult, that when you get promotion or elevation from God, the critics come out. The Bible says that when Saul became king, the the verse right after Saul becoming king was that some troublemakers came along and began to say, who is this Saul guy? He'll never be able to save us. And as a fourth grader in the spring, I started getting picked on. I showed up on the radar socially, and uh, some people just didn't like that. And there was a a boy named Chris Howe. I'll never forget Chris Howe in the fourth grade. He was as wide as he was tall. He was a big, stocky kid in the fourth grade, and he was a scrapper. He was hands down the toughest kid in school. He'd get in two or three fights a week. And uh, Chris Howe was always the the captain on the playground of one of the teams. It was football or soccer, and I was always picked last in these. Chris Howe would be a captain. A lot of times Marlon Jones would be the other captain. And Chris Howe, I remember this this day that that I was standing there waiting to get picked, and I was typically not picked. I would just go to, after everyone else's, I know, say, aww. Yeah, so that was me. And and, uh, this, this particular day, Chris Howe, his first pick, I want Jason. And I was like, I mean, it was almost like a, a, an ooh went across the playground. Ooh. Chris Howe. And I stood next to Chris Howe. And from that time on, he, he invited me to his birthday party. I was in Chris Howe's world. Socially, he, would, he asked me to sit with him at lunch. This was a big deal. And when you're standing next to Chris Howe, ain't nobody bully you. Nobody picked on me anymore. I don't know why he, he chose me. I think God places different people in our lives for different times. And even in the fourth grade, God put this boy in my life to help me. And he took me to cool school. Right? He, say, he would say to me, if you're going to be my friend, man, you cannot wear that shirt ever again. He was, don't walk like that. Can I just show you? Can you just walk? A and he taught me how to walk. He taught me how to, how to talk. He taught me. He said, well, here's a comb. You should try this. You know, <laughs> Comb your hair, bro. And He helped me. I carried his lessons through all of my years in public school. Chris Howe, and his, his, he really laid the foundation in my life and some of the principles in my life for how to cuss properly. Man, Chris Howe could cuss. He could cuss like a sailor in the fourth grade. And he showed me the five principles, the Howe principles is what they're called, of great cussing. I could cuss just as good as anybody. I could hang in there with everybody. You know, sometimes we need 
people in our lives to believe in us. And I talked to you about how God believes in you, and that's good. But God also positions people in your life that will believe in you. Because when a person believes in you, Chris Howe, it changed how I thought about myself. I knew that Jesus loved me as a fourth grader. I knew that my mom and dad loved me as a fourth grader. But when he accepted me, it changed and brought out things in me, some confidences, the ability to talk in front of the class, the ability to get involved in student council. I attribute a lot of these things back to Chris Howe. He moved away in the fifth grade, and I never saw him again, but I never forgot him. And isn't it true that there are people in your life, can you think back even, just take a few seconds right now, and think about somebody who believed in you. You know, we don't need everybody to believe in us. There was lots of people at my school that didn't like me. There's lots of people right now that don't like me. I don't need everybody to like me, but I need God to place just a few people in my life that will believe in me and see something in me I don't see in myself. And Jesus shows us this example. When he became a man and came to this planet, he began to show us how a man can believe and draw in greatness out of other people. He can draw potential out of someone through faith. Isn't that how we release God's power into our life? Isn't that the principal tenet of what Jesus said? Just believe in me and it releases things into our life. It's the same thing for what's on the inside of the people around us. That when I believe in somebody else, it has the power to release things out of them. Maybe things they didn't even know they had. Jesus would walk around and target people that everybody else overlooked. He targeted people that everybody else rejected. He targeted the fourth grade Jason, right? He targeted the people that were bypassed and, and looked down upon. And in fact, as he was a friend of sinners, he was criticized by people for targeting the kind of people that he went after. Why? Because the grace and the power of God needs to find a low place to manifest its power. It needs to find a crippled in order to create a miracle and get someone to stand up. It needs to find blindness in order to bring sight. You see, grace and forgiveness needs to find sin and weakness and addiction so that it can come in and bring redemption and restoration into someone's life. Grace is seeking out the low places. It's seeking out the lowly. The ones that people might call the little guy is what Jesus would go out and find. He'd say, oh, you're the chief prostitute? I want you in my ministry. Somebody say amen. Not just the prostitute, but I want the chief prostitute, right? I want the best of the sinners. Somebody say amen. He got Matthew the tax collector, and everybody would look at Jesus and say, why are you picking these people? These are the people that are rejected and overlooked. What are you up to? But Jesus would go and find potential. And when he would believe in them, I'm talking about as a man, it would release things on the inside of them they didn't know they had. These fishermen and tax collectors and these people that were nobodies, they weren't the teachers. They hadn't been to the best schools of the Pharisees. They weren't of the right lineage and heritage. They didn't have the right pedigree. But he found these 12 guys, and they became the apostles who would lead the church and write the New Testament. Somebody say amen. Jesus prided himself in finding people and through believing in them. We might even say, Jesus, maybe you picked the wrong guy with this Peter. I think he might, he may, you might need to pick somebody a little more successful, with somebody with a little more potential. But Jesus saw potential where other people didn't see it. John chapter 4 tells a story of Jesus going to Samaria. The Bible says so specific in this story that he was in Judea and wanted to go to Galilee. And it says in the Bible, the scripture is, he had to pass through Samaria. You know, I looked it up because that's what I do. I wanted to find out, did he really have to? Turns out there was a much more beaten traveled path from Judea to Galilee that went around Samaria. The Hebrews didn't like going through Samaria. They didn't like the Samaritans. They were always at odds with each other. The Hebrews looked down on the Samaritans and thought they were a lesser people, that they were lowly. But Jesus, it says, had to go to Samaria. He didn't. I believe that that, Bible, that scripture is telling us that he was compelled by the Spirit to go to that region. When he got to Samaria, he got to this, it says that he sent the, the disciples into the, to, up to Circle K to get some food or something. I don't know. He sent, them up to the, he sent them into the village to get some food. He was by himself. He orchestrated this, and he went and stood by a well, and a woman came, and he asked her for water. And he begins to have this exchange with her. He's, he says, you should have asked me for water, because I got the living water you need. He starts to stir on her a little bit. He says, why don't you go get your husband? 
And he knew exactly what he was doing. Well, he was pushing her buttons. She was like, I'm not married. You know, you know the well was a place where singles met, right? <laughs> so this was a bad conversation. <laughs> She's like, I'm not married. I like your robe. <laughs> and Jesus says, it's true when you say that you're not married, but you've had a couple of husbands, right? You're, you're, and you're living with a guy right now. And, and, and so he says this to her, and then he begins to talk to her about true worship. And then he says to her the big one. He drops the bomb. He says, I'm the Messiah. Right? She says, we're looking for the Messiah. He says, I'm the Messiah. Now imagine this. The Messiah who came down to save the entire world targeted one woman in one region, went out of his way to go to this well and target her. He was going to entire towns and cities and healing the sick, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people out to hear him preach. But he stopped what he was doing because he saw potential in someone. Someone that might have been kind of the town harlot, the kind of the home wrecker of the village. You know, hey, Jesus, if you know who this really woman really is, you probably wouldn't be talking to her. The Bible says that even the disciples, when they got there, they thought to themselves and wanted to say, why are you talking to that woman? Right? She's a Samaritan. You know, she's trouble. They would have overlooked her. But Jesus didn't overlook her. He saw potential in her. And she went and told her entire village. The Bible says that she went and told her entire village about, come see the man, she said, who told me everything about my life. you got to come see him. She got a whole village to come and see Jesus. The whole town turned out. The Bible says in this scripture right here, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. You see, when Jesus believed in her, then she went around and got everyone else to believe in him. If faith is contagious, man. When you see potential in someone else, they'll start to see potential in you. God will bring people into you. Watch this, though. Now, when did Peter ever go and get a whole entire village to come see Jesus? When did James ever go and get a whole entire town to come out? When did John ever go in? Where is there a story anywhere in the Bible where one person went and got an entire village to come and see Jesus? There was unheard of potential in this woman's life. Jesus knew if I can get her, she'll get the whole village. He saw something in her that she didn't see in herself that no one else would have seen in her either. The ability to influence an entire town to come out and see him. They begged Jesus to stay two more days, and he did, and taught this town in Samaria. You know, there were villages and towns that rejected Christ. He would go to places and preach the word of God, and they wouldn't believe him. But this woman from the well went and got an entire village. The woman that everybody else would have said, she can't do anything. She has no influence. She's the home wrecker. She's the runaround. You know, Jesus didn't go to her and say, hey, listen, I need you to clean up your life before you go and share me with others. I need you to go to a Bible college class first. I'm not sure you're prepared. We have some things you need to go through and some studies before you can get involved in ministry. Jesus didn't say any of that stuff to her at all. He just believed in her and it unlocked a power on the inside of her to change an entire town. Can somebody say amen? We just don't know maybe what people have on the inside of them, what they're truly capable of, and what if somebody would just believe in them, they could accomplish. We maybe just don't see the value around us. If we did, it's possible that we wouldn't ignore the downtrodden. You know, my mom and dad have, have, have really showed me an example in my life of reaching down, and I don't want to say for the little guy, but rooting for the underdog. Finding people who were in a down place and raising them up. And I think that my dad always did that because he was that. There was a time in his life when he was on the bottom. He felt like and believed he was the low guy, the little guy. He grew up in a line shack in incredible poverty. A line shack, if you don't know what that is, it's the little shack they build along the railroads. You weren't supposed to live in these things. But his dad made a house out of a line shack next to railroad tracks. And that's where they lived. He talks about when he would sleep on the floor next to the potbelly stove in the cold northern Wisconsin winters. He could see if it was windy, the snow would blow across the floorboards of their house. That's how the wind just cut through their place. He didn't have electricity till he was 13 years old. He talks about being from this and never really thinking that he could come out of this. 
This is just all they ever knew. But he was the first of his generation. He was the first of his father, his grandfather, of anyone in his family to graduate from college. That was a big deal to my dad. My mom put him through college after Navy. My dad went to the Navy for a couple years and served our country. And then she put him through college by going to nursing school. My mom was the biggest believer in my dad you could ever be around. She always believed in my dad. I lived in the house, and she was always calling him higher. You have more on the inside of you. You can do it. When he graduated from college, he went back to work to what he knew. He always worked with his hands. He was a lumberjack uh, in the northern woods of Wisconsin. He was good with tools. That was just all he knew. He went to college, but he didn't believe he could actually become a teacher. He just didn't think, well, I just don't have it in me to become a teacher. I, 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 don't, I can't stand in front of people and talk. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to go back to what I know. My mom was like, oh, heck no. I work nights to put you through college so you could become a teacher. You're going to become a teacher. Look at how he teaches the word of God now. And look what God was trying to do in his life. You know, God didn't come down and say to my dad, I need you to be a teacher in school. My mom did. She believed and saw something in him that he did not see in himself. She tells the story this way. He refused to get a teaching job, so she went and called the schools herself. She made a resume, and she didn't tell him what she was doing. She kept it a secret until she lined up a couple interviews on one particular day. She laid out and ironed his suit, and she said, this morning, you're not going to that other job. You're going to put this suit on. Here's your calendar. You're going to take interviews and become a teacher. She saw something in him that he didn't see in himself. And sometimes when somebody else sees something in you, we step into it. And when we step into it, the gift is revealed. Do you know that? A lot of times, you know, the world kind of tries to get and infiltrate Christianity in such a way that we don't believe in each other. That we see other people as a bunch of numbskulls who can't do anything. You become a supervisor at your job and nobody wants to do anything. And you just have, the world teaches us to not see potential in others and to put labels on everyone and put everyone in a box. It's just like Joseph's brothers, who when Joseph said, I have a dream, and his brother's like, God, you're never going to become a leader. Who do you think you are? It's just like David's brothers and his own father, who didn't even go and get him out of the field when the prophet came to anoint a king. They didn't even have a second thought about David. We're surrounded with people today that are the same way. They just don't believe in each other. We label each other. We come to the wrong and hard conclusions about each other. We see the homeless guy on the corner. We see the beaten up people in this world, and we think there's something wrong with them. Why aren't they motivated? Why, what, what's, what, you know, they're never going to be anything. Those are just losers in this world. They're just always going to be with you. But what if I were to tell you that homeless guy in the corner actually has it in him to cure cancer? If somebody would just believe in that... That woman over there, she's going to build a million-dollar business, but nobody's ever believed in her. It's not good to look down on people and to see people as smaller than us. To say, oh, I'm going to help the little guy because they're downtrodden. But instead, Jesus saw the greatness in the people that he was reaching down for. He saw the potential of what they really could become. And he unlocked that with belief. Just by believing in them, we could do the same thing. And when you believe in someone and you cause them to accept a new assignment, Right? That's what a lot of it's about. It's like, I believe in you. You can do that. And then they accept their new assignment. My wife is the most encouraging person in the world. A lot of what I've done in my life, I've been very insecure about. Going on a crusade to India, I was like, eh, I don't know. I, just, I don't see myself that way. That seems overwhelming. That mountain's too big for me to climb. My wife was the voice that you guys didn't get to hear who was in, in my house telling me, you can do that. You have it in you. Don't you see that God is calling you up there? I don't know if I can do it. When you hear someone else say it, even though you know God's already said it, it's just that bump you need sometimes to accept the assignment. And when you accept the assignment, I want you to know that's when the gift is revealed. A lot of times we want to see the gift working in ourselves before we'll accept the assignment. That's why we say, well, I can't do that. I'm not sure that I'm capable of doing that thing. But you know that God has put in you every ability you need to accomplish the purpose that he's placed before you. He's already armed you with every spiritual blessing that's available in heaven and earth and under earth. Everything is already yours. He did not give you some assignment that you cannot accomplish. But when you receive the assignment is when the gift is, is it's awakened. It was dormant until then. You didn't know you had it, but when you receive... Think about Mary for a second. She was always purposed to give birth to Jesus and be the mother of Jesus. 
But when she received the assignment is when the dormant gift came to life. That's when Jesus came from the inside of her own game and right, was germinated since conceived in her womb by the Spirit of God. It's the same thing for others around you. It's the same thing for the people around us. They may not know there's dormant gifts on the inside of them. But when you believe in them and it gives them the bump they need to receive the assignment from God, they'll step into something they didn't know that they could do. I had an Araya bicycle when I was a kid. I got it when I was in sixth grade. Now, in the sixth grade, when I got this bike, my dad bought me this bike from Pat Schwinn on Country Club. It was painted over. I didn't know what kind of bike it was. It was a 10-speed. It was a $35 10-speed. And it just was a piece of junk. I mean, just, it was horrible. It was hard to drive. It was rickety. When I rode that thing, it would barely move. The rims would wobble. And I rode it to school every day in the sixth grade. And then in seventh grade, I went to Rose Junior High. It was two miles, one direction, every single day, four miles a day, against the wind both directions, and sometimes it snowed. It was... <laughs> That's why I have such muscular... If you've ever wondered why my legs are so muscular, it's because of riding that bike for so many years. I'm kidding now. And <laughs> I'd put all the books on this thing, and I would ride this thing, and, and one day in the, in, the, in the ninth grade, I was in my garage. I was feeling very uh, mechanical, and I flipped that thing upside down. I thought I'd work on it a little bit. I started to scrape away the paint. The paint was chipping away on this old, crappy bike. And Sean Yarger came over to my house. He was a good friend of mine in junior high. And he rode his, his skateboard a mile and a half to my house that day. And he was into BMX racing. He was into skateboards. That was kind of his thing. And he came over, and he started to chip away the paint there with me. And he said, this is an Araya bike. I said, I don't care. He said, no, no, no. I have all alloy Araya rims on my BMX racing bike. They are $300 rims. He said, you've got Araya rims on this bike. You have the Araya cranks on this bike. He said, this bike is incredibly valuable. Did you know what you really had? You know, when I rode that bike around, I never locked it up. I was hoping somebody would steal it. <laughs> I was one of those kids. I'd ride my bike, and when I got off it, I just kind of jumped off, and it just went bang, 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 bang. You know, that was, that was how I treated it. But when I found out that it was an Araya bike, that it was like worth $200 instead of $35, I took it all apart. My dad helped me. We degreased it. I sanded it down. I got that Araya to shine through. I paint, repainted the whole thing, made it beautiful, and I rode that bike every day. I began to value it. I began to lock it up. <laughs> I didn't want it to get stolen. I didn't throw it down anymore. You know, how I saw it began to determine its potential. I want to show you a scripture in Song of Songs here. It says this, Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. She's talking about her husband. She's talking about her beloved. Now, it's a picture of the church in Christ. But look how she talks about her man. You get the idea he's not even in the room. Can I just say that too? He's not even around. We don't even know where he is. This is just how she talks about him. You know that believing in someone, I believe, starts in the home. It starts with your own brothers and sisters. It starts with your own mom and dad. It starts with your own spouse. It starts with your own children. You might say, well, I don't have a spouse right now. Start talking about your spouse like this. Even this, if you want to get married one day, speak this about your spouse. Say, he's like a tree among trees. He's like the apple tree. What was she saying? He stands out to me. And, and he's got apple. He's fruitful, right? He's productive, and I love what he produces. You know, sometimes a man just wants to hear, that after all of his hard work, that you love what he's made. You love what he's produced. You love to taste of the production that he has in him. Some people might say, see, my wife was talking about me long before we got married. She was like, he's like a shrub among the shrubs. Praise God. I want me a little man. Praise the Lord. Speak what you want. And then you might be married, you might be saying, well, that's not what my wife is. My wife's, you know, she's always putting me down. She's always nagging on me. It's never enough. My, my husband, he's a slob. He's lazy. And we call our, spouse, our, our parents and we might call our friends and we call our coworkers and we say something that sounds very different than this phrase. Because that's what the world's taught us to do. It's taught us to talk about our spouse, the old ball and chain, the prison, the things. Then we say these things out loud, but then we get the world's results in our marriage. We want God's results. 
And it's amazing what will happen if you'll start to believe in your spouse. You might unlock that billionaire that's in your spouse right next to you. Maybe they really are lazy, but you might unlock some productivity on the inside of them. Imagine if you're walking through your house and you hear a conversation happening in the closet. Your spouse is in there talking on the phone. Maybe your wife's walking through the house and she hears and overhears you talking on the phone. You're kind of talking quietly. And so she kind of leans in a little bit to eavesdrop on your conversation. And this is what she hears. She hears, oh, my wife is so amazing. I'm so in love with her. I'm so, I'm so attracted to her. I want to do something amazing for her this weekend. Do you have any ideas of places I could take her out or something? I want to just show her how much I love her. And, and she's, I don't know, what is she? I don't know why she's with me. And here's the thing. She's so brilliant. My wife is so brilliant. She's the smartest person I've ever met in my life. And then she's with me. I'm like, what are you doing with me? Imagine if she heard you saying, you're, gonna, you're about to get lucky. Can I just say that? She's going to come in there. You're going to have to turn that phone off. It's going to be down. Come on. You just make that phone call up. You don't even have to be on the phone. Just, just pretend, man. People just want to be believed in. We already criticize ourselves. We already don't believe in ourselves. We already think that we're no good. We already think that we look bad. We already think that we're not blessed. And when you have somebody else criticizing you, it just adds to that. But when you have somebody believe in you, you know, if you believe in your children, it doesn't matter what the teachers say about your child. It doesn't matter how they've labeled them. There's a study done by a name Robert Rosendahl. He took these scientists, and he gave them all lab rats to test them in mazes. 1963, he did this test. And he told the, the scientists, he said, these lab rats have each been bred differently. There are some that are bred to be maze bright. There are other ones that are bred to be maze dull. The maze bright ones, we believe, are going to learn mazes faster than the maze dull ones. Now, the trick was he didn't actually give them any kind of special rats. He just gave them a group of rats. None of them were labeled or bred specifically for maize bright or maize dull. He just told the scientists this. The scientists went through and tested these different lab rats, but they were the same. And the ones who were labeled maize bright actually learned mazes faster. And the ones that were labeled maize dull actually learned mazes slower. And it was, he believed it was because of the expectancy of the person testing. That the expectancy of what they could accomplish determined what they could accomplish. Isn't this exactly what the Word of God is teaching us? That if I expect my husband or wife to lose, they probably will. But if I expect them to win, if I label them maize dull, they'll probably be dull in the maze. But if I label them maize, isn't that what God's doing is removing the labels? I was at a cash register the other day, and this, this grocery store clerk, he was ringing in my bok choy. And he goes, uh, five, 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 four, five, four, four, fifty. He goes, I'm sorry, I'm dyslexic. I have a hard time reading numbers when they're four, four, five, four, five, five. And I was like, oh, you're dyslexic? He goes, yeah. And I go, you, did you know that dyslexia is a sign of brilliance, that your brain actually operates faster than most people's? And he goes, what? And I go, yeah, so everybody sees everything backwards in mirrors, and then your brain has to reverse it. But your brain is so fast that sometimes it gets glimpses of the mirrored image, and that's why you reverse things. Your brain is faster than mine. Did you know that, that a lot of great people were dyslexic, like Steven Spielberg is dyslexic? Pablo Picasso was dyslexic. They believed that Einstein was dyslexic. You operate at a higher functioning brain capacity than everybody else around you. <laughs> what did I do? I turned the world's label of a disadvantage into an advantage. I can't help but do that. That's just how my daddy raised me. Whatever problem people have, I can't help but to believe in them. I can't help but to see you and believe in you. I don't know any other way. When you bring to me your labels and say the teacher, did you know that two of my children were labeled by, our, by teachers in our school to have it learning disabilities? Two of them? Did you know that all of my kids, two of them have graduated with honors? One of them was top number one. The other one was top of her class. The next one now has a 4.3 GPA. My kids are killing it in school, not because of what the teachers said, but because of what the parents believed. Sometimes the world teaches us to kind of wait and see if our kids have it. 
Well, I hope my kid's going to be smart. That's the world system. No, no, no. They're already brilliant. They just need somebody to believe in them to unlock the brilliance that they really have. Can I get an amen? There was a woman named Esther in the Bible, and she was a foster kid. Her parents had died. She was of the tribe of Benjamin, which was the lowest of all the tribes. And she was living at a time when Israel was enslaved. So she was not only a slave, but she was the lowest of the slaves. If you know the story of Esther, she's going to become the queen of all the land. She's going to go from the lowest place. It's almost like the Cinderella story, but true. All the way to queen of the entire land. If you look in her life, there was two people who believed in her. Mordecai, her uncle who got her into the beauty pageant to make sure that she had a chance to win, he believed in her. He said to her at one point, it's possible God made you queen so that you could save us all. He believed in Esther. She would have been somebody who didn't believe in herself. Like that woman at the well, she probably didn't believe in herself, felt overlooked and rejected in her life. But because Mordecai believed in her, she ended up getting into the running for the queen. And then it says this guy named Haggai, he was a eunuch, he was... One of the king's attendants, he believed in her. He believed in her so much that he gave her the best of the best for one year of the beauty treatments and the right people around her to teach her how to be royal and positioned her in front of the king and she became the queen and she would in turn save that entire nation. Not because God visited her and told her, I have queen royalty for you, but because God used men to speak into her life and to believe in her. And God's gonna position people in your life that are gonna believe in you and God's gonna position people in your life that you need to believe in because God is trying to unlock the potential of the kingdom of God that's in this room right now and we're gonna help each other by believing each other. Can somebody say amen? Now watch this. After Mordecai does this great thing, look what happens for Mordecai. Verse four says, for Mordecai was great in the king's palace. You know, he wasn't great before. He was just a, he was just a lowly Israelite, just like everybody else in that land being enslaved. But it says here in verse four that now Mordecai was great in the king's palace and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man, Mordecai, became increasingly prominent, or in some versions it says, became greater and greater. You see, when you take the time to believe in someone else and elevate someone else, when you take the time to help someone else win in your life, when you take the time to let Jesus in you identify the potential in someone else and push them towards their assignment, God begins to elevate you. He'll take care of the elevation in your life and he'll take care of the critics in your life too. God has a win for you. Somebody say amen. He's going to position the right people around you that are going to call you up to the next level. He's going to position the right boss around you that's going to give you the promotion you need. He's going to position the right leaders and bankers around you to get your business moving in the direction it needs to be moving. God is going to position the right people who are going to believe and see your potential. Somebody say amen. One last story. When King Saul was made to be king, God sent the prophet Samuel to do it. He sent a man. God didn't go visit Saul and say, I'm going to make you king. Now, Saul made some bad decisions. It was kind of a picture of the law, and it had a, kind of a rough ending. But his beginning was right. He was chosen by God to be the first king of Israel. And God brought the prophet Samuel into his life. And Samuel said, you're going to be the next king. And he said... I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. You got the wrong guy. I'm the lowest of the lows. He was rejecting himself. But God positioned a man to speak and believe in him. We need that in our lives, and we need to become that to others. And Samuel brought all of Israel out together. And the Bible says that he brought all the tribes together, and he began to tell the people, I'm going to show you who the next king is. Bring all the tribe leaders and he chose the leader of the tribe of Benjamin. Then he said, bring all your clans forward. Then he chose the leader of the clan that Saul was in. Then he brought the families forward. He chose the family that Saul was of. And then he brought, well, where was Saul? He was making the announcement, Saul is going to be your king in front of all of Israel. But you know, Saul wasn't there. He went rogue. <laughs> Samuel inquired of the Lord, where is Saul? He's supposed to, this is his big day. Saul knew this was his big day, by the way. 
It says, therefore they inquired further of the Lord, has the man come here yet? So the Lord said, behold, he is hiding himself among the baggage. Have you hidden yourself among the baggage? Have other people hidden themselves among the baggage? Because that's what we do. We hide ourselves away from the assignments and the callings of God because we don't think we have it. We don't see our own potential. Other people around you don't see their potential. What they see is their baggage. They see their mistakes. They see their trouble. They're not sure that God would ever choose them. They can see their multiple marriages like the woman at the well. They can see their chief prostitute, right? Running a house of prostitution for a better part of their lives. Rahab was a chief prostitute as well. They see, people see their weakness. I'm blind, I'm crippled, I'm hurting, I'm addicted. I have a past, I have trouble, here's my baggage. And we hide ourselves among the baggage. And God didn't send, God didn't go to the baggage and call Saul out. God sent men to go get Saul out of the baggage. God is sending us among the people of, around it that are hiding themselves in the baggage to call them out and say, God has something better for you. You're not going to hide it among the baggage anymore. Somebody say amen. Come on, church family. We got to get people from hiding among the baggage. I want you to stand on your feet because I wonder if I could be a voice in your life this morning. I want to pray over you. I wonder if you would let me be Samuel to you right now. A man, just some dude, just some pastor who's preaching this morning, but who believes in you? And I want to speak over you exactly what Samuel spoke over Saul on that day when he declared him to be king in front of the people. He said this, 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 24, he said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? Surely there is none like him among all the people. Here is your king. I want to be the Samuel in your life today because I want you to know I don't care what people have said about you. I don't care who's put you down. I don't care about your past. I believe in you. I believe in what God's placed on the inside of you. I believe you have every ability that you need and I am not interested in the labels people have put on you. I'm not interested in the labels that people have put on you. I'm interested in the, the label that God has put on you. He's called you child of the king. He's called you righteous and blameless and holy. He has called a dormant gift on the inside of you to come to life and run your race and achieve your destiny. God sees greatness in you, and I do too. I see it in you, brother. I see it in you, church family. I see greatness on the inside of you. I see multi-million dollar businesses in this place. I see wealth coming into your life. I see healing for you. I see that label removed off of your life that never again will it distract you from the brilliance that God has placed on the inside of you. People have said you have a learning disability. You're ADD, attention deficit disorder. But you know what I say? You're just better at multitasking than everybody else. You're just smarter than everybody else. That's why you're distracted so easily. It's a great thing that God has placed in front of you today. Somebody say amen. Here's what I'm saying over you. I'm saying, look around you, church. Do you see this woman? Do you see this man? God has chosen them. God has made them great. Look at these people. There is not one that is like them. Come on, somebody. Here is your king. Here is your queen. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you receive it today? Give God some glory then. Praise God for you, brother. God's doing a work in you. Let me pray for all of you. Father God, I just thank you and praise you, Lord, for this word. We thank you, Lord, that you have placed and positioning the right people around us to see and believe in us, but also, Lord, that we ourselves can be the right people that believe in others, that you would make us those Mordecais, that, that like Jonathan, we would see the kingship on David, that like Christ, we would see the potential and those that have been passed over and looked over. That we don't see people as small, but we see them as great. And we find ourselves calling greatness out of them. In Jesus' name, amen.
I'm so glad that you're still watching. We're going to continue this on our Wake Up Show. It's a daily Bible study, Monday through Friday. You can go to YouTube and just search Daily Bible Study. You can find us. And what we do is we take what he teaches and what I teach, and we just go a little, we go farther with it. We it's do. a whole lot of fun. You can go to wakeuptv.tv, and also there you could donate. You could give. If you if you receive something today, we just encourage you to be gi- a giver. Yeah, be a giver and sow back into what the Lord has poured into your life. Make sure you always give to your local church, yeah. but yeah. your offering, you can give so that it allows us to take this message even further. We got your super awesome, amazing Discovering Your Identity book. Incredible. It's on Amazon. It's Yeah. And, and this is really about the confusion that's out there about people's purpose, about what they're supposed to be doing, direction, plans in their life, and really about who they are. Right. And so this is... It, it clears it up using scripture about who you are in Christ. So discovering your authentic identity, and you can search for this on Amazon. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want to give you that opportunity right now. It's very simple. It's very easy. Say this prayer with me and believe it in your heart and you have it. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't earn it. You can't somehow be good enough to do it. And so I know oftentimes the enemy wants to make you feel like, well, I'm not a good person or you don't know what I've done. But Jesus died for every one of your sins. Not some, but all. And I know that we all are still going to mess up, so don't even let that worry you. All that today is about is securing your eternity with a prayer. Say this prayer with us and believe it and you're saved. Dearly Father... I thank you right now for forgiving me of all of my sins. I ask you, dear Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. You're in. You're in. God bless you. Uh, We just thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.